Now on to our speaker for tonight. I've talked a lot. Um, Patrick O'Grady has been involved with the OAS since 2005 when he participated in one of the earliest BLM Clovis Quest surveys near Rimrock Draw Rock Shelter. You might be familiar with that name. Uh, um, so O'Grady earned his bachelor's, master's, and PhD from the University of Oregon and worked for their Museum of Natural and Cultural History from 2005 and until 2023. He is currently the district archaeologist for the Burns BLM and plans to continue a relationship with the OAS well into the future in that capacity. And if everybody could give a, a big hand, I think uh, <laughs> we're just going to take a minute. We'll get his microphone on. And we've got his presentation right here. So I can't get bigger than that. Uh, what are, we, are we using both of these or? Yeah. Uh, or... <laughs> So we have a unique thing where one is for Zoom and one is for OMSI. Oh my they wouldn't goodness. let us combine the two. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I could also hook you up if you like it. And Will that do both or? No, you still have to hold one handheld instead of two. <laughs> okay, we're we're gonna do it this way. Okay. <laughs> and do we have a laser pointer per right. chance? So I could. We probably should have done this before we got started, but so this is the advance mm -hmm. here. And then is this the pointer? That's right. Okay. Okay. All right. So I've got two microphones and a pointer. And what could possibly go wrong? So thank you for the introduction. Um, I just would like to say that... Uh, having changed jobs recently and having worked with the Oregon Archaeological Society for a number of years, I am an incredible uh, beneficiary of years and years and thousands and thousands of hours of volunteerism from the Oregon Archaeological Society members. Uh, literally tens of thousands of hours of volunteer labor not just thousands, but tens of thousands. I sat down and tried to work it out one day and the numbers got too big for me. Uh, that's just how long we've been working together as a group with me working uh, as an archeologist for the University of Oregon. Uh, now with me having transi transitioned into a job uh, as a district archeologist for the Burns BLM, uh, I'm already working on some ideas for getting uh, OAS members out in the field doing survey uh, and picking up the, the, the reins once again and working together to get something going out in the field. Uh, we are faced with some challenges that I just wanna talk about very briefly here. Uh, and those challenges have to do with changes in recent changes in the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Uh, so they're very good changes. They're important. Uh, I think that it's one of the best things that's happened in a long time is looking at the way the laws have been um, uh, implemented in the past and making changes that are more effective in the future. So I'm not sure exactly how long it's going to take for us to get on board with uh, um, what uh, the consultation process will look like and, and how uh, we'll be interacting on various projects. So I would like to think that we may be able to do something this summer uh, as far as volunteer survey, but I can't be sure of that. So I don't want to make any promises, but I did want to explain just very briefly why it is that um, we're operating the way that we are right now at the BLM and trying to get a handle on that before we before we tell you we're going to have something going on in the field. So what I want to do, this too microphone thing is crazy. So what I want to do tonight is talk to you about some recent changes, some recent um, analyses that we have been conducting with regard to some of the materials from Rimrock Draw Rock Shelter. Uh, it's a site that many OAS volunteers have worked at over the years and uh, one that um, I've been involved in since the first surveys were done in 2009. Uh, 
the way that this is set up tonight, I'm going to be using some information that I've, some of this you guys have seen over the years, and you're just going to be like, oh God, not that slide again. Uh, but there's other stuff, and particularly some of the slides from uh, the work that Tom Stafford has done that I think you'll find new and interesting. And I've set it up differently than what I've done in the past. So um, in Previous um, iterations of this presentation, we've kind of gone through an orderly follow the trail of breadcrumbs, sort of a step by step talking about what's been done out at the rock shelter when and you know what the results were and all of that. And instead, we're going to just talk about big categories of stuff and try and move fairly quickly through all of this. So you'll see that as I get started, there'll be an overview of the site in general, some pictures of what it looks like and uh, uh, where it's located and so on and so forth. And then we have groups of categories of uh, uh, information about the work out there that includes things like dirt, rocks, plants, animals. And so that'll just help us kind of get through this faster than we, it looks like we're going to at the moment here. So this is what the site looked like as of about 2021. Uh, I'm standing up on a uh, basalt spur overlooking the rock shelter, and you can see that the rock shelter is a very modest, just a strip of basalt sticking out of the ground that's about 20 meters long, and it's about five to seven meters high in some places. As we've excavated, it's become uh, more uh, more prominent through the course of excavating out the deposits very close to the, uh, the base of the rock wall. Uh, in this picture, you can see my shadows. I'm taking this picture, and I'm actually standing in the place where the stream channel for yeah. the rock shelter flowed past it and off into the distance, uh, going straight out from my shadow there. Uh, so there's the rock shelter. It's in wide open sagebrush step country. It's uh, got a stream that hasn't carried water in probably about 7,000 years that once flowed past it. And it's got some other things going on as well that we'll get to in just a second. So here's where it's located, roughly speaking. That triangle is huge, but it's over in the northwest corner of, the, of Harney County. Uh, right near the Deschutes County, Lake County, and uh, Harney County lines. It's in Great Basin. So uh, it's in the northernmost portion, northwestern portion of the northern Great Basin and right on the edge. So if you're in the rock shelter area, the stream flow uh, going from past the rock shelter take turns and goes towards silver creek and then drops down into the harney and malheur lake basin here's what it looked like uh when we first got out there and had a, a, a viewing of it in 2009 uh, at that time so we were working at a site called uh, the sheep mountain clovis site and uh, Scott Thomas was the district archaeologist, and he was going back and forth and bringing us supplies and getting really bored with that whole process. And so he saw this rim from a distance and decided to stop and have a look at it. And so he did. And what he found there was really interesting because essentially... There's a huge site that's about 300 meters in any direction from where this rock wall is. Um, so you can see lots of obsidian flakes and uh, uh, stone tool fragments, just a wide variety of things uh, by the thousands scattered on the surface all around the rock shelter. But when you're standing down there at the time that this picture was taken, you actually uh, couldn't see a thing on the ground except for one stone uh, tool that was broken in half by the cattle that were sheltered there. Scott took a look at that and he noticed a variety of things that made him think there was an old preserved rock shelter or, you know, an archaeological site there that hadn't been dug up or altered over the uh, millennia. And when he looked down between his feet, he saw that there was a seven to 12,000, 13,000 year old stem point laying right there, like saying, dig here, dig here, dig here. 
And so he came and got me. I was down at Sheep Mountain. We brought some students and had a look at the site. And then OAS got involved in the process from that point forward because we knew there was a site there, but we didn't know what the constituents of the site were uh, in terms of the variety of stone tools, the uh, age in general of them. And so for the next two summers, uh, from 2010 to 2011, OAS members went out and did pedestrian survey and brought back a wide variety of Western stem style projectile points. Uh, every afternoon they'd come back in and show what they had found and uh, in almost uh, probably 60 to 70 percent of what they were finding were western stem points in that 7 to 12, 13,000 year range. So we did testing at the site in 2011 in September after we finished the Sheep Mountain Field School. Uh, and that was a very productive season. We found a lot of uh, objects up to a five to six feet below the ground surface. And in this country, if you go back to this slide here, you can see that that's a erosional uh, area out there. It's windswept. It's sagebrush step. It's there's not much other than low growing shrubbery on the surface of the site, and uh, much of the northern Great Basin looks like that because there's not places for sediments to settle and take hold like there is at this rock shelter, uh, and so. The reason that uh, it does that is because the wind blows from the southwest and over the top of the rock shelter and carries sands and silts blowing in over the top. They settle down next to the rock shelter and it accumulates. And so when we tested, we found five feet of sediments with different components of, uh, you know, archaeological components. And we knew that we were onto something very interesting. So over the years, we've done... Uh, eight field schools. We've done a variety of testing and salvage projects out there. Uh, and in total, I've spent about 58 weeks out at Rimrock to our rock shelter. The best year of my life. So here's what it looked like in 2016. Uh, you can see the rock shelter shading over to the left, and you can see uh, open excavation pits, tall sagebrush. You can sort of see the stream channel, but what you can see is many, many thousands of sandbags that had to come out of those excavation units. Uh, those sandbags all carry uh, screened sediment that's been looked at for uh, obsidian chips and uh, stone tools and bones and, you know, all the things that archaeologists are seeking. Uh, all of that screen fill gets put back in the sandbags, and we use that to, to uh, backfill the excavation units at the end of the season. So what I want to do right off the bat is talk about the site in terms of the radiocarbon dates that we're seeing and frame it in a way that will allow you to think about the site the way that I do. So uh, at the top, all of those dates that are in black, can you see those okay up there? Okay, they are pretty large numbers. Uh, all of those dates at the top are either on sediments that have come from uh, stratigraphic uh, samples or from plants that were recovered from the excavations. And so if you look at the second column that's Cal BP dates, that's the one I prefer to focus on because those calibrated uh, before present dates are the dates that we can relate to in terms of time. Uh, radiocarbon dates uh, conventional radiocarbon dates are different. They record the amount of carbon in the atmosphere over time, which varies. And what we have are different means for calibrating those dates and putting them in terms of years in the past. So when you look at the Cal BP dates, you can see that the most, the dates in the, the top half of the column are between about 4,500 years and 10,000 uh, or so years in age. And those are on plants like sagebrush, willow, uh, sediment humates, uh, bulrush, and wapato. So 
up at the top in the more windblown deposits in the the sediments that uh that are settled down on top of a big layer of rockfall from when part of the rock shelter collapse um those are all in the 5000 4500 to 10000 year time range and they're all on plants so Below that, there's a dense layer of rockfall, and I want you to key in on that because the, that rockfall has archaeology in it uh, and stone tools of various kinds. But what it also does is it caps an older deposit that's been protected for a very long time. So there was people utilizing that site before the rockfall occurred, and there were people utilizing the site afterward. And so when you look at the dates that are underneath the rockfall, you'll see that those dates are divided into a couple of different color schemes. Uh, and the the black text is, from, uh, is on dates that we've done on Pleistocene animals that came, that were uh, found in association with stone tools at the site. And so the the black dates are bison and camel teeth that were uh, 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 AMS radiocarbon dated. And those are between about 13,000 and 18,000 years in age. Uh, the dates that are in red are redates of those original samples. We wanted to redate those just to get a look at whether or not the first dates are correct. So you'll see that underneath that first date in black, there's like a plus 45. And that just means that the date that we got on that sample when we redid it was 45 years older than the date previously or 200 or less than 115. So, uh, We've got sets of dates that uh, we'll talk about in more detail in a little bit, but I just want you to see that we have some materials radiocarbon dated above the rockfall and some dated below, and the dates that are coming from below are much, much older. So the questions we're asking when we're out there working at the site is, how did people use the rock shelter? How old is it? You know, what are the erosional and depositional influences? And just what's the paleo environmental context of the site? And I'm not going to go into the terms that are down below, but we know that the site was occupied from the late Pleistocene from uh, about 18,000 years ago to about 12,000. And from the transition of the Pleistocene into the Holocene about 12,000 years ago to about 7,000 years ago. I can't really see that whole list down below because the text is recording over it. So <clears throat> I'm just going to leave it at that for right now. So let's talk about why people were there and when they were there. And that has to do with water. When you're standing on top of the rock shelter, so this is looking out across the sea of sagebrush from above. And you can see that squiggly line shows the edge of the rock shelter. Uh, uh, don't step there. But if you look down below that, you can see that there's a long arrow that curves and that shows the, the dry stream channel that's present out in front of the rock shelter. So approximately five feet or so of windblown sand, silt, and volcanic ash bury the old Martian stream deposits right in front of the rock shelter, but it's still clearly visible uh, as a, a stream scar in the uh, landscape. So when we look at the site now, we think, why would anyone want to live in a desert like this? You know, it's, oh, but oh, clearly at, at the time that that site was occupied, Maple. what's Earth. that? Question? Okay. Okay. Um, so one of the things that became very important is when Tom Stafford was out there working with us, who provided the radiocarbon dating and many other aspects of the work that we did at the site, he had a tendency to draw notes on his hand. So you can see here that he's got his day's notes right there on his hand. And if I could get a hold of him and stop him long enough as he was like buzzing around from here to there, I get a picture of his hand so that I could maybe transcribe some of that stuff into my notebook. 
Uh, but Tom is a sedimentologist and he is a geochemist and a paleontologist. And he's just a man of many trades and <clears throat> very skilled at what he does. And we invited him to come out to the site and work with us. And so uh, Tom explained the site in uh, uh, several ways that are pretty significant. Uh, here he's working with the esteemed Jordan Pratt down in the trench. And Tom decided uh, or determined there was a three-part sequence in general for what was going on at the site. Uh, the, the largest uh, layer is windblown sands and silts over a layer of Mazama ash. So in this picture, you can see the sun on the top of the, on the surface of the site. And then about where that tape measure is pointing to is the transition between the dark marsh clays and the volcanic ash that's sitting right on top of it. Uh, so volcanic or uh, windblown sands, Mazama ash, that dates to the eruption of Crater Lake 7,700 years ago, and then Cienega or marsh clay deposits underneath it. And then underneath that is a layer of high energy boulders and cobbles and gravel from flood events that occurred uh, when water was running through that area at a fairly high velocity. So here's Tom in another view uh, taken in front of some of the boulders from when we trenched out in front of the rock shelter. And you can see those boulders are clearly worn. They've been uh, modified by uh, stream flow and um, erosion in a stream channel. And look at the size of those. So those boulders are coming in. Uh, not too far, but there are either some were present, some were coming in, uh, and they are modified through the rounding process associated with long term water flow. Um, we know that the boulders that are present there date, or not the boulders, I'm sorry, but the stream flow, the last time the stream was active was about really about 13,000 years ago because we have a bison tooth that we dated from the very base of the uh, gravel deposit from the stream and uh, got a really firm date on that of 13,000. So w it, the stream deposit is one thing. That's the oldest, deepest layer in the stream channel. Above that is a layer of slow moving or uh, still water that's associated with a Cienega, a marshy area. Uh, an oxbow, slow moving, uh, perhaps marsh or ponding. Uh, and so um, that's probably the time frame when the site was occupied the most was when that marsh was present there. It seems like during the time that the stream was busy moving fast, there were people now and then, but not as commonly as when the marsh was there. And then on one side of the stream channel, we, uh, when we were trenching the site, we found some really interesting artifacts that were in a protected setting. And when we were excavating down into that, that area, looking for a possible spring that was located there, uh, we, we dug up a couple of artifacts. And when we picked them up out of the bottom of the excavation unit, it was water was seeping in. So we think there is still a spring there. And Tom thought there was a spring there when he was working because you can see that those dark clays that we uh, uh, associate with streams, clays associated with uh, springs or slow moving uh, activity were starting upslope from the rest of the stream channel. So that suggested that water was coming down, uh, to trying to reach its way down toward base level uh, rather than uh, being associated with the stream edge because water flows down, it doesn't go up. And so it has to come from higher up in the area where this is. So we have a stream adding to the, to, to the water sources. We have a stream, we have a cienega or a marsh. Uh, we have a spring on one side of, on the opposite side of the stream from where the rock shelter is. Uh, and then we have things happening after those started to settle out. So um, where's the water coming from? What 
uh, during two th during the year 2000, during the time of COVID, I spent three and a half of really great weeks out there doing surveys of all the stream drainages coming in to the area around the rock shelter. You can see the, the rock shelter is circled there, that black dot 35 HA 3855. Um, there's a, the area that's grayed, in, grayed out is the lake level. And then those other ovals mark the presence of playas that are currently there, including Rimrock Lake, Hay Lake, and Wheatgrass Lake. Uh, we have dates of 18,310 calibrated years before presence on the bottom of the Rimrock Lake deposit. And we have date of, I believe, 16,000 on Hay Lake. And uh, it looks like from just a simple glance at the topography and, and filling in according to the elevations that are shown on the topography, that at one time, probably that entire basin was filled in with water and provide a steady supply of water feeding the system that goes past Rimrock Draw and out towards Silver Creek and then uh, the central Harney Malheur Lake basins. Let's see. So lots of water uh, in different forms coming into the area around the rock shelter. And then the big water that we think was feeding the system very early on was coming from a large uh, lake that appears to have been there uh, beginning about 18, 19,000 years ago. So now moving quickly into dirt, let's talk about dirt. Uh, and I mentioned this a little bit previously, but um, the dirt or the sediments that we're seeing at the site, uh, Stafford identified as an aeolian or windblown deposit, uh, volcanic ash uh, separating the windblown deposit from the marsh clays. And then underneath you have stream gravels. And you can see those are pretty three very distinct layers here um, in this image. So one of the things that's really intriguing about this deposit is that when you're in the trench directly adjacent to the rock shelter in the stream channel, you can see below that there's those dark um, sediments. They're kind of dusted with volcanic ash in this picture, but those dark marsh clays are chunky, blocky, prismatic, you might call it, uh, and uh, very... Um, organic in their composition and sitting it right on top of those marsh clays is a really fine bead. You can see it really well in this image of uh, volcanic ash from the catastrophic eruption that occurred about seven, uh, 7,700 years ago and settled onto that surface and just stuck and held. Uh, and then above that you have redeposited Mazama in layers that are that are churned up and blown in from other places. Those other playas surrounding the area, after the eruption, you had volcanic ash on the surface that got blown. Because of the prevailing winds, it got blown in over into the rock shelter area uh, and deposited. In some places, when you're walking around out there after the trench was dug, this volcanic ash was a foot and a half thick in one trench in particular. So it was just like walking through fine um, uh, talcum powder, but just a huge thick layer of it from the redeposition from the surrounding area. So the great thing about a time marker like Mazama is you know the date and you also know that that material if it's in its original context, that material, everything above it is more recent than the, the eruption and everything below it has been preserved in place from uh, before the eruption. So it's really important. It makes it easy for a guy like me to figure out what is going on to some degree out at the site. And then... This, I don't know what happened with this picture. But anyway, this is just another view of another trench further downstream from where the first one was. And you can see that Jake is in there uh, doing uh, profiling and sample collecting from the bands of uh, aeolian or windblown sediments, the volcanic ash, 
and then uh, the marsh clays that are down below it. So you have this sequence, and it's consistent from one end of the site, one end of the area around the site to the other. So when you see those deposits, you know what you're looking at, whether you're in the rock shelter or whether you're in the surrounding area and digging down, um, excavating down into it. Are there any questions so far? Okay. And then these are some views of what the uh, schematic views of what the sediments look like, the volcanic ash, or I'm sorry, the windblown sediments, the black cyanaga muds, the gravels, and then bedrock underneath. And then those are the dates that we have associated with those layers that Stafford collected and then radiocarbon dated. So the one I like is the one that's right up at the top that says in conventional radiocarbon years is 6,770 plus or minus 20 years before present. And the calibrated date is 7,662 uh, to 7,585, which puts it right around the time that Mazama erupted. <clears throat> and then inside the rock shelter, when we things are a little more muffled because people are occupying that area and there's foot traffic, so you don't see the same crisp, distinct lines of the sedimentary layers there. But what you do see is the windblown material. You see a, a marshy deposit that is intermixed with uh, uh, rocks from the collapse of the rock shelter wall. And uh, then underneath that, you see alluvial sands from when the, the stream was running at one time and then flowing into that area as a backwater and leaving finer sands back in the back of the rock shelter area. The rock shelter itself is not very uh, deep. It's only about three to <clears throat> three to four meters or so deep at the very best. You can crouch back there and protect yourself from a windstorm. Uh, or a rainstorm, I'm sorry. But the great thing about it is even in wintertime, if the sun is out and you're standing in that rock shelter, uh, the wind's blowing up and over you. And it might be cold outside, but you're, you're comfortable because the air is still and you can feel the sun on you. And it's just really, um, it's, a, it's a pleasant environment to be in. Just don't expect to stay dry if there's a big storm. And then in this in this map, this is a schematic map of the excavation units that we've dug over the years. And it's like, oh my God, how are we gonna you know make sense of all this? But but that's another side of things. Uh there's, there's several units I want to point out to you. Uh unit two, which is that big two by two over on the right hand side in this view is uh, the area where we got tooth enamel from both camel and bison. Uh, unit 30 is an area where we got tooth enamel from camel, uh, some possible bison tooth enamel. Unit 19 and unit 18 over there, just like three to four meters to the west is where we're getting bison tooth enamel from both of those units. And then up in the upper uh, left-hand side, units 38 and 39 is where we've seen those big, intact, really nice stone tools in association with spring deposits. So I'll be talking about those here and there, especially in the next part of things here. So I want you to know where those are in relation to each other. So let's talk now. We've talked about the water that's come through the site. We've talked about the uh, sediments that are present there. Now let's talk about the archaeology, the, the stone tools and other materials that we're seeing at the site. In terms of diagnostic artifacts, um, we have very few stone tools that are made from Elko times to more recent. And Elko points are uh, named after the type site, which is in near Elko, Nevada. Uh, and they are a triangular projectile point that's notched in the corners. Uh, so if you're out hiking around the desert, you're out with OAS doing a survey and you're walking around in a place and you uh, encounter a point laying on the ground, 
probably six to seven out of 10 times it's going to be an Elko point because they're so common out there uh, because of the climatic conditions at the time people moved in carrying those stone tools. But out here, we only have a half a dozen or so. Uh, and more recent types of stone tools, we don't have, we have even less of those present at the site. So made after 6,500 BP, uh, those types of stone tools are in common. But when you go in the other direction, made before 6,500 before present, we have a lot of stone tools that are uh, associated with Western stem tradition with certain types of uh, flint napping that's associated with making Paleo-American style points um, or Clovis type uh, stone tools. Uh, over a hundred different diagnostic points and flakes that are associated with early technologies are uh, present at the site. So when you think about the the fact that there's the, the Mazama settled on the ground out there around seven thousand seven hundred years ago, uh, and people's uh, water must have been less common on the site after that time because the archaeology tells us that people were not coming to the site very much after that time, even though the Glass Buttes um, obsidian source is 10 miles away at probably at most from that position. So we have uh, stone tools of various kinds, but most of them predate 6,500 years in age. Here's a view of some of the stone tools, this wonderful photograph by Katie Lancaster uh, showing the variety of stem points that we have present at the site. Many of them are broken. They're just uh, uh, people came to the site to retool, get make new stone tools to attach to the atlatl dart or spear point. Uh, and leave the old ones behind. So we have a lot of broken ones, very few intact ones, and they many of them have those weak shoulders that you can see in this image that indicate that they're associated with a stem point, Western stem point technology. Here's some more. These are some of the other types of uh, stem points that we're seeing from the site. There's some square base. There's some uh, rounded base. There's uh, the notches that you see taken out of them are for doing obsidian source or uh, obsidian hydration to determine in a relative sense how much water has been absorbed since that tool was made back in time. Uh, we do it a different way now, thanks to some pioneering work by Dan Stuber. Um, but you can see here that you have uh, more stem points in a wider variety. And then we have gravers and other types of scrapers and specialized use tools. A lot of these, when we find them, are coming from underneath the rock layer at the site. And there's a few above, but the majority are down below. And the stone tools that are made of high quality shirt or jasper or chalcedony are primarily coming from underneath that rock fall that I pointed out in the early part of the um, uh, presentation here. So these have m multiple bits on them for doing like compass engraving. One, the second one from the left has a perforating tip on it or an engraving tip. The one on the right has a convex scraper on the right side and a concave scraper on the left. And it has a engraving tip and other types like a Swiss army knife of sorts. And these are extraordinary tools. And I think they're uh, interesting, more interesting in many respects than the projectile points we see at the site, because they tell us very specifically um, that people are engaged in activities other than just hunting or butchering or moving through from one place to another. Michael, do you have a question? Um, they're, well, they're localized in this place uh, underneath the rockfall. So they seem to reflect early events that were occurring at the site. Uh, in terms of the stone itself, uh, uh, geochemically sourcing 
crypto crystalline silicate or, or chert or jasper uh, is very difficult. And there are people that are working on that, but we don't know exactly where these came from. Does that answer your question? Well, yeah, there's a little, a little bit of that too, but I think the projectile points that we see mostly at the site are those that were taken off from uh, dart points or spear heads and dropped and replaced with new uh, points right there at the camp. So one of the stone tools that you may have seen here and there is in various places is this uh, Chalcedony uh, multi-edged uh, scraping or, or knife or scraping tool. And in the upper right corner, the, you can see that there is a, uh, at the bottom, there's a slightly convex edge, a scraping edge on one side. Um, and on the uh, right-hand side, there's another edge that is um, also either a cutting edge or, or a scraper of some type. And then the picture where the person is holding that object in his hand, you can see there have been multiple flakes taken off of either side of that, um, that disc-shaped uh, stone tool that looks like it was a sawtooth edge. So it's a very important artifact that came from the site and it is a very distinctive one because it has multiple edges and what makes it more distinctive is that it was found underneath the oldest data material at the site suggesting that it was uh, deposited at or before the time when we got the oldest dates from the site and then the other thing <clears throat> that we have at the site are crescents and including those two complete ones on either side that Alex Nyers just uh, recently did some uh, obsidian sourcing on and then those fragmented ones that we were found either uh, in our excavation units or on the surface uh, over in the area near where the spring was located. Crescents are uh, somewhat enigmatic stone tools because uh, they've been, it's been suggested that, <clears throat> excuse me, that they are transverse points uh, associated with uh, hunting ducks, waterfowl at, at uh, shorelines, or possibly as a handheld sickle for gathering uh, bulrush and tulies, things like that uh, on the edge of marshes. And uh, I'm not sure uh, one, if one of those is more correct than the other. But the important thing is that they're always seem to be found in areas where we have big bodies of standing water, which would make a case for that uh, lake that I showed you the picture of earlier. <clears throat> and then the obsidian stores, sources that I have coming um, from uh, stone tools that are coming from out of the site are mostly local. So the yellow dot over there, just slightly to the left of center is where the site is located. And then those uh, red dots are uh, nearby obsidian sources that include sources near burns and sources in Glass Buttes area, uh, relatively close to the, uh, to the site within about 25 to 40 miles probably. And then you can see there's a string of sources. Whitewater Ridge is way north of the site, up closer to John Day. Uh, Venator is over at the northwestern uh, edge of Steens Mountain. Uh, you have Coyote Spring in Nevada, Alturas Fine Grain Volcanic in California, Hoglin Butte over near Paisley Caves over in the Summer Lake area. And then you have Silver Lake Sycan Marsh, which is in Klamath country. And we've done some recent work on uh, more obsidian sourcing and the sources are coming up the same. So it looks like in general, the obsidian was pretty localized in its uh, procurement and uh, uh, return to the site. So now <clears throat> let's talk about plants. In general, uh, we can see that there's sagebrush, rabbit brush, and juniper throughout the deposits. 
And um, as we go from top to bottom, we're finding those in uh, small hearths associated with various parts of the rock shelter. But when we get down deeper towards the layer of collapsed uh, roof fall, uh, we find more fire pits that are larger uh, and more intensely um, uh, filled with, with charcoal and other uh, charred material uh, that contains those same fuel woods, but it also contains willow, serviceberry, chokecherry, bitterbrush, bulrush wapato and an unknown hardwood and wada. So when we see wapato and wada, which is a plant used by the Northern Paiutes extensively, we also think about big water. Those are coming from a place where um, there was still water uh, in volume uh, nearby. So you have crescents and then you have some of these, what are now upland plants, uh, some riparian plants, and then these still water plants like Wapato and Wada. So these are just some pictures of the uh, hearths that contained some of this material. So this one had, uh, let's see, was that the one with bulrush or? Oh, you you get the same thing I get. So I think this one was bulrush. And uh, I'm sorry, and uh, in the 9,500 to 9,300 year range. And then this one had wapato or Indian potato that dated right around 10,000 years in age. And it's sitting in and on top of that uh, collapsed roof fall. And you can see those thick bands of charcoal in this hearth and cross section. So you've already seen these dates. I'm not going to focus on these, but these are the sagebrush and um, uh, the various plants that we've gotten from above the rockfall that date from 4,000 or so to 10,000. And then we have the rock layer. So those, those botanical dates show what was going on above the rockfall, but now let's talk about what was happening underneath it. And we'll focus on that through Unit 2 and the Units 18 and 19. So here's where those are located. Just again, pulling up one of those old rock shelter maps to show you where we got the um, uh, oldest material in the site, both in Unit 2 on the right and Units 18 and 19 on the left there, about three to four meters apart. So some of those rocks that we were trying to get through were pretty big. And uh, this is a fellow named Terry Paddock who came out to teach us how to break rocks. And he's using steel wedges and feathers and drilling holes in the rock and then splitting off big chunks uh, and getting underneath it. And why did we think that we should be doing this in the first place? So, you know, who in their right mind goes and tries to bust up a rock that big? Well, archaeologists for one, because they just don't know any better. Uh, but the other reason is because when we saw these rocks, when we excavated down on top of them, we could see that there was um, none of the evidence that would suggest we were close to bedrock. Oxidized clays, oxidized orangey rock, you know, uh, uh, scaly rock from uh, where uh, basalt is weathering off of the parent material. Uh, we just didn't see any of that here. So we thought that we were still well up above bedrock and that there might be something in between the rocks and the bedrock underneath them. And so we started busting up these big rocks here uh, to get them out. And then this is uh, excavating in unit two after those rocks are removed. So you can see in the wall, you can see chunks of those rocks that are in place still, uh, but you can see that the people that are excavating there are underneath that rock layer and they're in some orangish sort of sandy clay material underneath. And then this, that was in unit two, and this is in unit 19. So, Part of the reason we've been out there for 10 years is because as we expose these rocks, we have to uh, excavate around them. And if we find any uh, uh, obsidian chips or any stone tools or bone fragments, 
uh, or hair or fuel wood or tiny bits of rabbit bone or that, everything gets recorded in place and gets photographed and uh, recorded on level sheets and in our paperwork and in our notebooks and that. So it's a very slow process. But the thing that was incredible is that this is up at 220 to 225 centimeters below the surface. And you can see how dense those rocks are in that area right there. And so they're latticed in, they're, they're layered in and they're stacked, you know, on uh, top another. You have to get one rock out, record it, what's dig underneath it, collect that stuff before you can get to the next one. And it's just that way for over a half a meter. So there's 220 to 225, there's 265 to 270. And this picture shows um, in a kind of a difficult way that there's a piece of bison tooth up there by that uh, centimeter scale with those toothpicks stuck in the ground. Um, and so as we're getting down underneath those rocks, 50 centimeters or more of those, those rocks in place like that, we're starting to find more stone stone tools and we're starting to find uh, pieces of tooth enamel. And it's not just any kind of tooth enamel, which is where we get into now. So what we found was camel and bison teeth and then, uh, or yes, camel and bison teeth. And then we found a variety of bones that look like some are, were definitely um, bison bone fragments and uh, then thousands and thousands of pieces of rabbit bone and uh, other material that is that is settled in place in underneath that rock layer. So in some of our five centimeter excavation levels, which is about that much, we were getting 1700 pieces of bone uh, from rabbits and small animals. <laughs> uh, yes. You remember that well, don't you, Jordan? Uh, and and we're also finding hair and uh, plant remains and charcoal and a variety of other things underneath there. And so it's been very difficult to get a date on the stuff because most of the time it's very um, mushy. The charcoal in particular is, uh, even if we collect it carefully and put it in foil and uh, protect it, when it gets to our uh, uh, archaeobotanist, she's having a terrible time finding material that's, that's ready to be a dated. So instead, we decided to work on getting dates off of uh, tooth enamel fragments from the large animals that we're seeing there. And so how much material do you need to get an AMS date that's a very high precision sort of a date? Well, Tom put this slide together for me, and that's a poppy seed uh, next to a needle, you know, obviously. But that's about the amount of material that you need to have that's been processed to get a date. Now, if you had a sample, I had another slide that I didn't put in here, but if you had like five poppy seeds, that'd be about the amount of material you need to start with to get the amount of material, the process to get a good AMS radiocarbon date. And then this is another slide that Tom put together that shows uh, this was a piece of mastodon tooth that he happened to have around for this, for um, putting this together. But that's the sample B is 20 milligrams of solid enamel. And then A is 20 milligrams of powdered enamel. And um, that's, about the amount you need to process to get a date. So that tells you what we can work with in order to get radiocarbon dates. And uh, now you can even date hairs, which we're hoping to do in the near future, uh, and other material that is, um, if it's processed correctly using the most uh, high precision methods to do it, you can get a good date on a very small piece of uh, organic material. So 
tooth enamel is very challenging material to get a date on, uh, but we have more of that that is consistent from one portion of the site to the other. And so that's what we chose to work with. And then, so this is a slide of a piece of bison enamel that was dated from the site. And this shows you in cross section what the different types of material are that you're working with, trying to get in there to get a sample that's worth uh, AMS radiocarbon dating. In general, that's a good cross section. And then this is a cross section before that, that piece of material was processed. So you can see what the tooth enamel looks like when it's originally um, taken from the field. And you can see in this case, it's got a lot of uh, uh, ferrous uh, um, percolation coming in from the exterior towards the interior, but you also have fields of white tooth enamel that are well-preserved and not uh, stained. So let's see. So yeah, let me revisit this for just a second. So that is where we're getting the, the bison tooth enamel, the camel tooth enamel. Those are where we're getting our samples for radiocarbon dating. And <clears throat> what Tom is doing is using a very fine micro drill to get in to that material that's preserved in between the layers of manganese and the layers of, of, of uh, iron oxides that are coming in from the middle or from the exterior towards the interior and working with just the pure white, um, clean tooth enamel. And so the dates that we were getting, uh, this is a repeat of that first slide, just showing you the range of dates. And then these are the sample sets we were working with. So in 2018, we got a date on our camel tooth enamel fragment that was 18,300 uh, plus or minus 35 or 40, something like that. Uh, and so early on, after we found somebody that was willing to take on the dating of the tooth enamel fragments, uh, which was Tom Stafford, uh, the first date was in the 18,000 year time range. And so that tooth enamel fragment was underneath a layer in unit two of volcanic ash from the eruption of Mount St. Helens 15,300 years ago. Uh, so you have volcanic ash from Mount St. Helens 15,300. You have tooth enamel from a camel that is 18,300. And then we had that orange chalcedony stone tool that I showed you the picture of that was underneath those things. So if everything is in its original depositional order and protected in that deep deposit, then it should be the case that the oldest materials are going to be at the bottom underneath the material that was deposited on top of that. So we had one date, uh, other than plant dates, we had one date uh, that suggested we had a stone tool underneath uh, of, of camel tooth enamel that was 18,300 years old, and we couldn't report on that. So the big obsession that has been driving this project just to get to where we can actually start a conversation about what's happening at Rimrock Draw Rock Shelter is the fact that we have to find something else that dates or we have to redate that camel tooth enamel and we have to redate uh, or we have to date other types of tooth enamel and see what age range they're all in. And so in 2018, we got the camel ops molar dated. Uh, and then we followed that up with three bison teeth uh, from trench 2019 one and two fragments from unit 19. Uh, so that was our initial four dates, camel and three bison teeth fragments that dated uh, in the 17,000 to 18,000 year time range. Then we needed to redate all that material to make sure that the dates were correct. And so Tom redated that material. And then we followed up that we got those dates back in 2023. And then we followed up with set four, which was more bison teeth, more bison teeth and uh, a camel incisor 
that we found in unit 30 adjacent to where we found the first piece in unit two. So now we have three radiocarbon dates in the 18,000 year time range on camel tooth fragments. And we have five dates on bison tooth fragments that are in the 18 to 17,000 year time range. So now we've got the dates piling up and we can talk about the oldest dates in the site being in the 17 to 18,000 year range. And until we got these dates, we couldn't do that. So it's like, we want to write, we want to explain what we've been doing at the site. People are like, you know, this guy's out at Rim Rock Draw Rock Shelter. What are they doing out there? You know, nobody hears the thing, but we've been trying to get our dates in order. And so here's what they look like. So in the top left corner, the camelid tooth enamel fragments from units two and 30 uh, are three, and they date from... 18,140, say on the low side, to 18,650. The bison dates, which we have from units 2 and 19, uh, we have more material from other portions of the site, but those five dates are in the 17,149 to 18,300 something time range. So we have... Bison dates that are coming out in the 17,000, 18,000 year time range. We have camel tooth fragments that are coming out in the 18,000 year time range. So when we separate those out and look just at the material that's being found in unit two and the adjacent unit 30, where we're finding all the camel material, we have four dates that includes three camel and one bison, and they're all in the 18,000 year time range. And in unit 19, we have four dates all on bison that are in the 17,000 year time range. So we can say now that when we're looking at those two sets of units, this units 18 and 19 over to the West of about four meters, uh, we're getting dates in the 17,000 year time range that are consistent and in units two and 30 slightly to the east by uh, a short distance, we have dates in the 18,000 year time range. So that's consistent. And now we're seeing something that we can really talk about. So here's what those first pieces of material looked like when they came out of uh, unit two. So yeah, I, I, didn't have the ash to take a picture of, but the Mount St. Helens SG Tefra was for 15,300 uh, at a minimum, as usually goes back to about 15,600 or, or further back, depending upon the date range that you're looking at. But, but so the St. Helens is 15,300. The camel tooth enamel is 18,300. And then we have a stone tool underneath it that is by extension maybe older than 18,300 years in age. Here's what the tooth enamel fragments look like when they came out of the ground. The one, the series over on the left-hand side are all the camel fragments that came out of unit two at about 273 centimeters below the surface. The picture up at the top left is the camel molar fragment uh, for, after it was collected in the field. And then down in the bottom picture is that camel molar fragment in association with a camel maxilla fragment from the Juntura formation that was uh, uh, examined by Edward Davis and then by Tom Stafford and Greg McDonald, who is the paleontologist for the Bureau of Land Management. Here's uh, what the what the sample looked like after it was removed from the large piece of camel uh, tooth enamel, and then you can see the cross section down below. It doesn't show up because of the um, text that's being uh, recorded. And then this is the camel incisor that we found in unit thirty next to unit two. So that's the second. Uh, tooth that we've gotten from camel that we've dated. So we have two different pieces of camel tooth and enamel, uh, one from an incisor, one from a molar, and they both all date in the 18,000 year time range. So you can see how big a camel is in relation to a 1200 pound bison or a 800 pound, 600 pound elk, somewhere in that range. Uh, there were big animals and that is the incisor without the root. So the 
tooth enamel were collected in unit two from 263 to 275 centimeters below datum. The bison tooth enamel in unit 18 was 263 to 265. So you can see that we're getting these materials out at similar elevations uh, underneath the rock layer in two different portions of the site. This is the bison tooth enamel. So is, I wanted to include this just so you could see what the tooth enamel looks like when you're seeing it on the exterior. And then you see it with the enamel and some preserved dentin on the uh, interior portion of the molar fragments. And then another test that we've done recently is we looked at a single piece of uh, bison tooth enamel that OAS collected when they screened a huge uh, chunk of the uh, backhoe trench deposits looking for ancient stone tools. They found this particular specimen and Stafford compared uh, whether the enamel was dating differently from the dentin on the interior. And you can see that there's a date difference of about um, a thousand years or more on the enamel. So we knew that the dentin would absorb carbon more readily th than the enamel would. And the enamel uh, is producing the most accurate dates on the site as we expected. And then this is another test that we've done recently um, that Stafford has done recently. So he took off the exterior manganese accumulation off of a piece of bison tooth enamel uh, and he dated both pieces. So he dated the, um, the freshly exposed uh, enamel underneath the manganese oxide. And uh, that date was 12,545. With the manganese on, it was 12,525, so about a difference of 20 years. So we can, we're looking at the different materials that we've been working with at the site and trying to see where the um, problems are. And so manganese accumulation on the exterior is not one of the problems. Uh, we haven't been uh, dating the dentin, so that's not a problem uh, And in general. Uh, because there is so little carbon ad accumulated at the site because it is basaltic volcanic rock and it's not a carbonate bearing sort of a uh, sedimentary deposit. Uh, if anything, the dates are probably more recent than uh, they're, they're too young rather than too old. And then the other things we have have looked at over time is uh, stone tools. The chalcedony stone tool that I showed you that came out from underneath a camel tooth enamel uh, tested positive for bison blood residues. These are five, six pieces of obsidian, uh, you know, flakes, and some have tool edges, worked edges on them. Uh, and we have one here that tested positive for horse two that tested positive for bison blood residues and one that tested positive for mountain sheep. So in terms of Pleistocene animals in blood residue and in tooth enamel, we have horse, by, uh, horse bison, and camel all represented at the site. And then the other thing I wanted to get to just very briefly is that that Cal Sedney stone tool that came from unit two is matched by a piece of material that is very much similar to it from unit 19 at about the same uh, depth. And so uh, we have two pieces of the same stone that are coming from different parts of the site at about the same elevation or the same depth. And then uh, the picture on the right shows two disc-shaped stone objects that came uh, out of the site. The chalcedony piece has got bison blood residue on it. The large obsidian piece over to the right has horse blood residue. So we have cutting or scraping disc-shaped tools that have blood residues from Pleistocene animals on them. So and then the latest, just basically to wrap things up, uh, the deepest archaeology, because of what we've looked at in terms of depth, uh, uh, disbursement of stone tools and tooth enamel and that uh, in stratigraphic 
uh, in vertical control, we have uh, uh, consistency across the site. So it looks like when you go from one side of the site to the other, you're finding similar materials at similar depths uh, underneath that layer of rock that was uh, deposited there sometime before 10,000 years ago. We have blood residues associated with Ice Age animals. We have, um, you know, I've just talked about all of this stuff. But but so the things are lining up and showing a consistency from one side of the site to the other that suggests that things were preserved pristine in place. And why were people here? So um, it appears that Rimrock Draw is a time capsule, especially underneath that deposit of rockfall, of human activity well back in time, 18 to 17,000 years in age. And then uh, up until about the time that Mazama erupted, there was lots of flowing water. There was a stable marsh. Uh, and then when Mazama happened, it wasn't that far away. Uh, so when Mazama torched off and blew the top off of uh, what now has become Crater Lake, uh, it appears that that event did something to the hydrology of the uh, uh, stream going by the rock shelter and the other water sources, and people stopped coming there. And we know that people stopped coming there because the most common stone tools that we expect to see at the site uh, or at any site in the northern Great Basin are not there. There's just hardly any of them there suggesting that there was no reason for people to stop there if there wasn't water. And so contributors, there's been many contributors to this project. Uh, most of all, the Oregon Archaeological Society. We wouldn't be where we are uh, without all of you having participated in some way or another, whether it was out in the field or uh, through financial contributions. Uh, there's been a lot of people that have uh, done a lot to help us understand this site and get to where we are positioned now to actually talk about the site uh, as a 17 to 18,000 year old archeological location on the landscape. And then there's the 2020, uh, 21 crew. So that's all I have. It's been a lot, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes, there are. Uh, what the question was: Have his camel uh, remains been found in other places in North America? And yeah, actually, camels are are quite common in our not so much in archaeological sites, but in the fossil record. Uh, we have some other um, areas in Oregon, including Fossil Lake, where we have a possible camel uh, kill site in association with stone tools that's been debated back and forth, as many things have been in archaeological um, uh, uh, discussions. But but yeah, there's Wally's Beach up in Canada has a, a, a camel kill site, I think also a horse there. Uh, so yeah, they are present, but they're just not real common. And to have datable, dated material uh, buried underneath a rock fall in association with stone tools and other uh, cultural materials is just, um, it's, we're pretty lucky to have stumbled into that one. So. Another question over here. Okay. Yeah. Uh... You're, you're, you're getting blood res residue from bison or, or horses and so forth on your stone, stone tools and also the to uh, on the tooth enamel. One, can you get a DNA extra, uh, analysis of that? Also, when he people are working with stone tools, inadvertently they're going to get their fingers cut. There are going to be some human blood. Have you ever found human blood on these stone tools? And... Finally, the other question is, are you going to be following that uh, stream channel to see if there's other sites along that 
old an ancient stream channel in the desert. So let me make sure I have all the questions correct. So the the answer to the last one, because I can remember that one, is that yes, we are hoping to do additional trenching uh, at different portions of the stream channel downstream from where the rock shelter is. And uh, we've done two trenches already, uh, and we're looking for evidence of archaeological sites in association with the stream channel that are buried along its edges. Um, we're hoping to do at least three more. Uh, in terms of human blood residue, we don't test for it because we expect that that was probably a likely circumstance and that's uh, you can get blood residue, but you can't get DNA uh, in that circumstance off of, you know, using antisera. And then the other part of that is that we are using a type of a DNA study uh, to look at the tooth enamel, and, which will allow us to determine the genera of the animal. Uh, it won't allow us to, to determine what the animal is down to species, but it will allow us to uh, determine whether it's camel, horse, or bison, just as a verification of what we are seeing uh, visually. And then the process that we're working on uh, is specialized enough that we'll be able to determine the sex of the animal too. It's a forensic application that's used uh, in crime scene studies. And so if we can determine just very simply that there's multiple animals present at that site, then we don't have one camel, one horse, and one bison, but we have people returning there to or butchering numbers of animals at one time. Uh, and that'll give us a different sense of how the site was used rather than a, you know, a more refined sense rather than a more basic sense. So, yes. Um, yeah, I was um, going to ask about butchering. Do we know that the camels and the bison are being butchered? The ones, the, the evidence that you have, is there evidence of that? Or are we just assuming because we've got tools and bones? Do you know my question? Um, I, we're assuming to some Instead degree. Instead of like just animals dying in this region. Yeah, the, the fact that we have those things, uh, we have tooth enamel and other animal bones associated with stone tools that do have blood residues, I think is a decent case, but it's not an unquestionable case for sure. Do you have bones where there's evidence of being No. Uh, the bones that we do have preserved are very challenging to work with because they have a clay coat on them. And they've been down in the ground for a long time. And so when I've tried to clean the clay coat off of the bones, uh, some of them are very fragile and friable and uh, they'll fall apart in your hands if you push too hard to try to get that material off. So I would like to look very much for cut marks, but even a rabbit bone takes an hour to get all the sediment cleaned off of it. So it's never going to happen while I'm doing it. I'm not I'm not young enough to make that one all the way through. Another uh, question over here. Yeah, on the uh, rock wall. You said there's a rock fall. Did that extend that three to four meters back? Was that any more covering the area that people would be occupying that this rock wall fell the rock fell in on? Yeah. And were there hearth I mean didn't hear much about hearths, but I wondered if there was uh, a few hearths in there that you excavated, what time range they would have been associated with? The hearths, the hearths are well preserved, relatively speaking, above the rockfall. Uh, down in the lower deposits, we have evidence of charcoal. Uh, we have collected charcoal down there. Uh, but those sediments have been, uh, where, where we're finding that material, the sediments have been really damp for a long time. And so when we try and collect the charcoal pieces that are there, every time I see one and we dig it out with a trowel and put it in a little foil packet, you know, it's like, oh, this is the one. This one is really great. I know we're going to get something off of this. And then we give it to our uh, archaeobotanist and she says, it's a smear. I can't do anything with this. I can't 
do a, I can't identify it to species. I can't get you a radiocarbon, a datable piece of material. Uh, we're just batting out right and left on that organic material down deep. We see it, but we can't get it in a preserved enough circumstance to where we can do much with it. But we do have wood fragments, uh, unburned wood fragments. We have hair. Uh, we have other things that are preserving down there in place that we may be able to get something off of. And um, now that we have these dates and we've got confirmation and then reconfirmation, I think we can make a pretty serious case for applying for funding on a larger level than we've been able to presently. Uh, hang on just a second. Yes. Dennis. So, um, having stood on the edge of the precipice there, was there any uh, Possibility or discussion that these could have been a uh, bison jump site? Um, it could have. I, I think that that's possible um, because in some bison jump sites, there's been a circumstance where have people position it along the drive line on either side. And if you can get them going up from uh, one direction and have them directed by people, uh, you know, focusing their path, then you can get them to go over a place like that. And it would be an effective way to kill them in numbers. Uh, I just don't know what kind of numbers that we have there based on what we've seen. It's a, it's a small rock shelter uh, and the two the the tooth enamel fragments that we have, although they're numerous, they're not they're they're not big concentrated chunks. They're they're dispersed fragments for the most part. So we're not seeing that evidence that would say that uh, large animal num a large number of animals died right there. But it, I think that there were people. If you're at that rock shelter and you climb up on the the uh, ledge up above it, you know, on the ridge up above it, you can see right over to where that lake is and you could go and uh, spot animals that are present over there, butcher them and bring uh, parts of them back to, to camp. And one of the things we have a good record of ethnographically is the fact that uh, when there were large animal drives, <clears throat> the heads were the preferred um uh, you know, specialty item uh, of the drive. And so uh, uh, Northern Paiutes, the antelope chief or the antelope charmer would uh, was the person that ran the drive and he would collect all the heads and disperse them to the people that he wanted to curry favor with. So we know that heads were a favorite item in terms of cooking. And there's actually, if you think about it and you have a sturdy sort of a uh, constitution. There's a great video of a guy uh, prepping and cooking a, ro a camel's head. Um, it's, a, it's some Chinese fellow who uh, goes through the whole preparation process, getting the head ready for uh, uh, stewing. And then, uh, uh, then they have a big feast at the end of it. But it's kind of a grisly process getting the camel's head ready for the feast. So I don't sorry, I got on a little bit of a rabbit trail there, but <laughs> it's a great video. For comparison, uh, what are the oldest dates of actual human remains in the general area? Actual human remains? Um the the best dates, like the blue chip sort of dates on human remains come from Paisley Caves. And that's where the University of Oregon Field School, under the direction of uh, Dennis Jenkins, uh, uh, excavated uh, dried human fecal material and did DNA to determine that it was human waste and then got a radiocarbon date on it. And that date is 14,300 years in age. So if if you're talking about human remains, that's the oldest in the area. I didn't see if there's any questions on the Zoom chat, but we got another question right here too. 
<clears throat> and I saw it on one of your plan views. You had a backpack bin, and I, I wondered what's the evidence for burrowing rodents in the site as a whole? Does do they go down below the the rock fall, or is there any burrows or rodent bones or anything mixed in with the rabbits? Um, there should be uh, rodent remains down. I mean, you, you know, the, the the pack rats and the other rodents that are present at the site are widespread and very intense in their operations when they're up in the uh, windblown material. So we have lots of tunneling, lots of rodent activity. I would expect there would be similar circumstances down below. So there should be some bioturbation in terms of remains we can see some uh rodent incisors in the concentrated uh animal bones at the back of the rock shelter in an area where it appears there might have been a hearth of some type i don't know if that's the result of bioturbation or um or, you know whether that's the result of subsistence uh processes but in terms of rodents getting down in relatively recent times down through the rock layer and underneath it, we just don't see a lot of evidence that that's been happening. And that's in part because those rocks are so concentrated in there together and they overlap each other. Uh, it could happen, but we just, when we've dug out there, we haven't seen too much of that. We see it all around, you know, uh, road and tunnels up above are very common and very clear and there's badger and also coyote and there's some you know big digging out there too but not much that we can see uh in through the rocks and then underneath it and part of that is just because everything's been down there for so long it would be hard to pick something like that out too all right i think <laughs> you got a couple more questions. Are you up for uh, sure. one or two more? All right. We're getting, this will be the last two questions here. So looking from the parking area with the, with the little cliffside on your left and forward, I don't know if it was before or after the trench, but there was a little draw in there that looked kind of interesting. I'm wondering if any unit had been opened up out there yet. So I'm not sure what you're referring to. Well, the, the, the rim rock kind of curved around to the left as you're standing by it. Uh -huh. there's, there's like a little V back in there where it looked like it was super shelter. You know, you had shelter on three, on basically two sides versus one. Um, uh, so are you talking about on the east side when you're coming down the, what, well, are you talking about on the east side when you're coming down the trail toward the site or are you talking beyond that on the west side where there's that little uh, lunch alcove back yeah, there yeah the lunch alcove okay. thing yeah we've done some excavation there uh, there's some in, some really nice lenses of clean uh uh uniform sand back there uh we at a meter below the surface over in unit 12 we had a layer of volcanic uh tephra from newberry that's 1300 years old we have northern side notch points and uh coming out from that portion of the site uh but Really, as you get deeper down there, we just aren't seeing much of anything older than northern side notch. I can think of one stem point that we've gotten uh, at about uh, two meters below the surface somewhere. Uh, that was in unit three. Um, but in general, uh, if we do find western stem points over on that side they're usually in the top 40 or 50 centimeters they're not down deep so yeah it's a, it's a we've dug all over that place we're trying really hard not to do any more digging uh, but uh we were also trying to get a sense of where things were laid in at various portions of the, the site right there against the wall 
And so that just has it has a more recent sort of a, a feel to it. And the artifacts suggest that too. All right. Go. Got, got one more. Sorry. <laughs> Is, is the bison the modern bison or would it be bison antiquus for the older bones or are you able to tell? Uh, we can't tell. So uh, it would probably be uh, antiquus. Most likely. All right. I think that's it for tonight. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks. For getting here. <laughs> Juggling two microphones. And thank you, everybody, for showing up. This is great. Have a good night and safe driving. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing my best. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't know.